Please stand as we read God's word. <clears throat> Our reading today is from 1 Samuel chapter 1. We'll read the first 20 verses. These are God's words. There was a certain man from Ramathame Zophim of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of jo Joram, Jeraham, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuf, an Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion, because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord and all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved, and her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah, and Elkanah knew his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. You can be seated. Good morning. What, what challenges do you face daily or regularly? Do you have ongoing conflict with someone in your family, or your household, or your life. Where is square one? What is the root of the problem? Maybe the problem is someone outside of your family. Why are they inside your head? When and where do you tend to have conflict? How and why do things get to you? These are natural questions, especially when we feel unbalanced, upset, or undervalued. We live in a fallen world. Hannah had to deal with her rivalry with Penina, probably with daily thoughts about Penina. She had to, if I can say it this way, she had to deal with it profoundly. Her very identity was under siege. Penina had children, and Hannah did not. And Penina used to grind it in her face regularly. If you look at verse 7, it says, Hannah used to provoke her grievously to irritate her. Man, I don't know about you, I'm just a simple boy who grew up on the Mississippi River. But that sounds pretty bad to me. It's like Eddie Haskell giving Beaver the business. 
It's like the Democrats sticking it to the Republicans, or the Republicans sticking it to the Democrats. This is continuing business, business as usual. The reason Penina is treating Hannah this way is not only to suppress her, but also to validate her own self-worth. How are the people that bother you merely trying to validate themselves? In any case, we're going to learn from Hannah and God's word today. We're going to learn how you deal with problems and challenges from people. Let's pray. Lord, you are good to us. You're merciful to us. Not one of us can claim that we deserve salvation. Not one of us can claim that we've earned salvation. The best any of us can do is say in our hearts, in our minds, and with our mouths that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. We put it all at your feet, Lord. The music today amazingly connects to the Word, even though it wasn't pre-planned that way. And so, God, we see in this that you continue to take care of things always for your people. Please watch over us, Lord. Please teach us today. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Got your pen handy. Whenever we have a problem with someone, we should ask ourselves three primary questions. Three primary questions. Number one. How does God see this matter? Number one, how does God see this matter? Number two, have I adequately acknowledged God and his sovereignty in this? Lots of, question, lots of Christians go around all day long fretting and worrying about something, and they haven't really acknowledged or recognized God's sovereignty in the matter. So number two is, have I adequately acknowledged God and his sovereignty in this? And number three, what prayers have I offered up? Right, that's piggybacking on two, that God is in control. What prayers have I offered up? To truly understand your problems, you've got to move them from being me-centered to being God-centered. Let me say that again. To truly understand your problems, you've got to move them from being me-centered to being God-centered. Now, a humanist or something like that would say about this, take it from a five-foot view to a 5,000-foot view. There's some value in that, but that's not really what I'm saying. Where I'm saying something qualitatively more than that. Take it from your angle to reality, to how God sees it. Hannah does this. Hannah does this. She shifts her thinking and her emotions from herself to God. She stops fixating on Penina and starts concentrating on God. Our sermon today has three parts. Day to, number one, day-to-day -day or regular, regular life, rivalry between Hannah and Penina. The way you say Hannah in Hebrew is Hana. Kathleen told me not to go around and do that. Rivalry between Hannah and Penina. I, we're getting a little reverb, guys. Number two, it's a new system. Be patient with us. Number two, second part of the sermon, God's sovereignty, and number three, prayer. Let's start with Hannah's regular life. Look with me at verse one. Now, I, just, I really want you to think about men and women. 
I really want you to think about what your life would be like if you were in Hannah's situation. Because, I mean, look, you can get jealous about your brother because he can hit a baseball better than you or throw a football better than you. Or you can get jealous about your sister because she's got nicer, a nicer dress than you have or shoes. But this is a whole different magnitude. Okay, so look, look at this. There was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, and the son of Jerahem, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuf, and Ephratite. Now here's where, here's where it gets hot, hot, sticky, and messy. He had two wives. Guys, one's enough. One's enough. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Peninnah. And Peninnah had children. Some scholars thought she had maybe as many as ten children. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. So Hannah doesn't have any kids, and, and Peninnah's running around with her, base, her baseball team following her. Now this man used to go up year by year from a city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, Phinehas were priests of the Lord. On the, now here it, really gets, here it really gets, here you start to see the boil, the pan starts to boil. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and all her sons and daughters. So he was taking care of them, right? Verse 5, but to Hannah, he gave a double portion. I mean, this word in Hebrew is a little bit trickier. It could be the best portion or a double portion or a certain portion that was really good. It maybe wasn't something, it wasn't quite as good as the portion given to the priest. But, but, but he, to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though or even though, you could translate, the Lord had closed her womb. Now, kids are important today. But y'all know, in ancient societies, the buck stops with kids. Right? Pass on the name. And the property. And her rival, Peninnah, used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on, year after year, time by time. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord. Bethel. She used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more than ten sons? Wow. You know, this is normal life everywhere. Not the polygamy. Polygamy isn't normal anymore, but rivalry is. I've had the privilege to manage many people over the last 20 years. Most people bring their dynamics with their brothers or their sisters or their parents to the job. Some people even bring their dynamics with their in-laws to the job. You've heard of sibling rivalries? Boys pushing boys, give me that. And girls gossiping about girls. Did you see that outfit? In Hannah's case, her husband is really stoking the fire. 
He may not mean to. He may be trying to be nice by giving Hannah more. He may be trying to encourage her and lift her up by giving her more or by giving her the best. But at the end of the day, the outcome is conflict and rivalry. Now, this is also true in groups of people. And I try to be careful to do, not to do this as a pastor. If you ever see me doing this, please feel free to come and see me and correct me. When we treat one group of people preferentially over another group of people, it irritates the other group. It doesn't matter how big or small the group is. The group could be as small as in a family, like here, or with one child over another child. The group could be different parts in a church or a corporation. One department gets more resources than another department. You know, I can tell you, sales departments and accounting departments usually have friction, at least at the top. Right? But even in our nation, even in our nation, when we favor one group of people in our nation who are citizens, over another group of people in our nation who are citizens, we're contributing to conflict. As Christians, we should avoid this habit. God's word, word speaks clearly in this. God is no respecter of persons. Can I get an amen to that? God is no respecter of persons. God doesn't care what group you're in. God doesn't care what color your hair is. God doesn't care about stuff like that. God sees the heart. God is no respecter of persons. But all of us have lived what's on the page here in 1 Samuel in one way or another. Rivalries. We've all lived it. What's special about Hannah is how she responds. Hear me now. What's special about Hannah is how she responds. She doesn't manipulate she doesn't strike back. She doesn't, try to, she doesn't try to wield her husband's favor against Peninnah. She doesn't try to do anything like that. Not, not in the text. She doesn't try to obtain a child in an unnatural way, way. Instead, she relies on God. Look with me at verse 2. This is God's sovereignty. Point 2 of our sermon is God's sovereignty. This is point 2. God's sovereignty, look at verse 11. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, uh, translators can do with this Lord of armies, but the root is even deeper, and actually if I remember what they say right, this is the first appearance of this phrase in the Bible. Lord of hosts. Lord of many. Lord of on and on and on and on. Of all the groupings. O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me, and not forget your servant, so she positions herself right towards God, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. Hannah's statement is very precise, but embedded within it is one simple truth. Hannah acknowledges that God and God alone has the power to give her a son. God, Hannah says God is over this. She's got a problem. She puts it in God's hands. God is sovereign. It is to God whom she must appeal. Now, most of the time... We as people do not want to face the facts. just want you to think 
about your own life for a second. Are you the kind of person who likes to face the facts? What'd you say, Mike? No, you're not. Okay. Hey, that's honest. That's honest. Most of the time, we as people do not want to face the facts. And the facts are, by the way, usually pretty simple and pretty straightforward. We just don't like them. But behind all of the facts is the truth. God is sovereign. In fact, that's why we call Jesus Lord. How many of y'all call Jesus Lord? If I don't see every hand, I'm going to come stand in front of you. And if you're asleep, you ain't going to see me. I'll just be standing there like my brother used to when he was a professor. When he, was a, he used to, when a student, he told them the first day of class that no phones in class, and if he saw one using a phone, he'd just go over like this. And when they lo finally looked up, he'd say, and he'd confiscate. Right? God is sovereign. That's the fact. Calling Jesus is Lord, calling Jesus Lord is an acknowledgement of that. Philippians 2.10. Therefore, God has highly exalted him, Jesus, and bestowed on him the name that is above God. Every name. So that the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. Who bestowed on him this name? Who lifted him up? Who exalted him? The Lord. God. God. I am who I am. He is sovereign. But what a blessing we have that Jesus is our Lord. Compassionate Jesus. Do you realize at the time of Jesus, for the Romans, you know who their Lord was, most of them? Caesar. Caesar, right? In German, Kaiser, right? In Persian, Shah. He was their Lord. Aren't you glad that compassionate Jesus is your Lord? As opposed to Caesar? As opposed to Hitler? As opposed to Stalin? Christ. Sweet Jesus is your Lord. It's very, very important for how you deal with people, for how you deal with reality itself, that you're clear about the fact that God is in control. If God is in control, Christian, everything in your life makes sense. If God is not in control, then it just looks like random fragments, like the scientists think. God is in control of the big things and the small, of the complicated and the simple. I'll give you a, a, an example. How many of y'all have kids? How many of you love your kids? See, they all stayed up. Good. One hand went up for the second question. They wasn't there at the first. That's okay. Just catching up. Imagine having kids and not recognizing that God gave them to you. That could be disastrous. You could treat them like you own them. You could start trying to shape them in your own image instead of after the pattern of Christ. You could try to make them follow in your own footsteps in terms of a, a job or a vocation or how they approach problems instead of having them follow in the footsteps of Jesus. No wonder the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. You just put the apple right next to the tree. Hannah doesn't fall for any of this. She acknowledges that God and God alone can give her children. She acknowledges God's sovereignty. And 
she gives up all her rights to her son. That's an amazing thing. He will be for the Lord from day one. Uh, this just makes me shudder. It makes me shudder. Hannah's deepest desire is for a child, yet she's willing to completely give him up to the Lord. That's a picture of sacrifice. That's a picture of Christ's sacrificial love. Okay, so we've seen Hannah's problem, and we've seen Hannah get her heart right with God. Now let's see what she does. This is part three of the sermon. Prayer. Prayer. Look with me at verse 12, and then we're going to look at 17 and 20. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Now look down at 17. Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah, and Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name, Aaron pronounced it correctly, Samuel, remember El meaning God, Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. Hannah got her wish. Your Christian life will be effective because of your prayers. Your Christian life will be effective because of your prayers. Our church's ministries will be effective because of your prayers. Our church's ministries will be effective or ineffective because of your prayers. Our nation will turn and become a Christian nation or not because of your prayers, because of Christians' prayers. God in Christ has granted us an amazing gift, the gift of prayer, the gift of reliance upon him. Will you use it? Will you wake up in the morning and pray for the things that your family needs? Will you wake up in the morning and pray for the things that our churches need? Will you wake up in the morning and pray for the things that our country needs? Your Christian life will be effective because of your prayers. Um, We have Lydia today because of prayer. It's a true story. Kathleen and I prayed for a child, and within a few days, God put Lydia to us. Like that. We weren't spring chickens. I think I was 35. I won't say how old Kathleen was. Right? Your life changes because of prayer. And this accords perfectly with God's sovereignty because what God is looking for is for you to sync up with him through prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. God isn't looking for you to change his mind and his understanding through prayer. His mind and his understanding are perfect. He knows everything that's going to happen. He's looking for you to sync up your life with his through prayer. Let your requests and your petitions made known to you. And, and, and if they're good and right for you, he will grant them. And if they're not good and right for you, he'll change your heart. He'll soften your heart. He'll teach you. We must pray because God is sovereign. I need to be honest with you. I think American churches have a real problem with this. We always want to be doing something, right? As if prayer is not doing something. We always want to be doing something. Please 
turn with me to Luke 6. Verse 12. I'm sorry. Yeah, verse 12. Luke 6, verse 12. Notice this is pr pretty soon before the Beatitudes. If you've got a pen, you might want to underline this. Maybe. I'm going to underline it. Oh. In these days, he, meaning Jesus, went out to the mountain to pray. Jesus went out to the mountain to pray. The Lord went out to the mountain to pray. God the Son went out to the mountain to pray. God the Word went to the mountain to pray. And all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose twelve. Whom he named. And then it goes through the list, starting with Simon, who was the leader, Peter. Simon, whom he named Peter. The disciples became disciples because Jesus prayed. The disciples became disciples because Jesus prayed. How about you? Who prayed for you to become a disciple? Who prayed for you to become a disciple? You know, before I was a, a Christian, in, in my mid-twenties I had a hard job. And I was working with the families of sick and dying children. That was my job. That's where I met Kathleen. She was doing the same thing. And I would go. And you'd see a child who was so sick, and you knew that they were on their way to passing away. And what could you do? And what needed to be done? Prayer. Now, I wasn't even a Christian yet then. And I knew I needed to pray for these kids. I didn't even have Jesus Christ running my life yet. I knew his name, but I wasn't following his Lord. I didn't even have Jesus Christ running my life yet. And I knew these kids need a prayer. Imagine the focus and the difference that you today, a Christian who's following Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, can make in people's lives through prayer. It's astonishing the time that you spend looking at McDonald's dollar menu you can offer up a prayer for someone who's sick and really hurting. Now what's worth more? That stinky, greasy cheeseburger? Now, I love cheeseburgers, you all know that. But what's worth more? Right? Faithfulness and prayer. Faithfulness in prayer. So let's wrap up. Let's move back to our original three questions and apply a little bit more. You've got daily problems in your life, problems with your kids, or problems with your spouse, or problems with your job, or problems with a relative in California, hey, when I get a call and I see that the area code is from California, from one of my friends from college that lives out there, I take a deep breath first. <sighs> Let's get centered for this conversation. 
because they're living a different life out there. You've got problems with your kids, your family members, any of your friends. Hey, this country has problems. This country has problems with race. Question number one. Question number one. How does God see this matter? Let's discover true north first. How does God see this matter? You've got a problem with your spouse. You've got a problem with your friend. You've got a problem with your family member. You've got a problem with your neighbor who's got a different background than you do. What's true north? How does God see this matter? What does God's word say? That's first. How does God see your marriage? How does God see relationships between people? Love and grace are always first with the Lord, right? How does God see relationships between people? Question two. Have you acknowledged God and his sovereignty in the problem? If I know, if I know what God wants for my marriage, if I know what God wants for my relationships with my neighbor, if I know what God wants for my relationship with my kids, but I'm not willing to follow him as Lord, I'm not willing to acknowledge his sovereignty, that's like one of that, that's like that movie uh, Fast and Furious where the car hits the wall. Right? It doesn't do anything to know what God wants if you're not willing to follow him as Lord. So question two, have you acknowledged God and his sovereignty in your marriage and your personal life? Have you told God that you will live out his expectation for those relationships? I mean, hey, in my flesh, I might not always want to treat that other person well, but in God's love and mercy, I'm able. Question three. What prayers have you offered up? Do you pray for your marriage daily? Do you pray care into your spouse's life regularly? Do you pray for reconciliation in this nation? If I'm honest with myself, if I'm honest with myself, I'm not always honest with myself, sometimes I don't want to face the facts. Remember, we talked about that before. If I'm honest with myself, I realize I've often fallen short. Right? I haven't prayed enough for my marriage. I haven't prayed enough for this nation. Many, many times I've failed to adequately pray for other people. But there's good news. Jesus is Lord. He can make everything right. He can flip the switch because he truly is in control. Remember. Can you stand up for a second, Aaron? We don't, we don't have a problem with each other, but imagine we did, right? It's not hard to imagine, right? If Jesus Christ died for Aaron's sins, and if Jesus Christ died for my sins, then if we're both willing to submit to Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is certainly going to give us the grace we need to work this relationship out. See, the problem is we won't accept God's sovereignty that we're to love one another. The problem is we won't accept God's sovereignty that we're to pray for one another. The problem is that we're stuck on ourselves and we're not stuck enough on God. Thank you, brother. Is that okay? Not humiliating? No. Thank you. Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose. You're walking in his resurrection life now. Turn your life over to him completely. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your love for us. Thank you, Lord, 
that you didn't make any of us exactly the same as each other. Even identical twins are not exactly the same as each other. Even identical twins have an eye that's a millimeter different placement on their head. But you didn't make any of us exactly the same as each other, but you made all of us for your glory. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for creating us. Thank you for nourishing us. And thank you for saving us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, help us, like Hannah, to turn over our lives and our difficulties and our problems, even with family members. Help us to turn them all over to you, Lord, because you do reign and you do call us to come to you in prayer with our heart requests. We thank you for these things, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.